As we talked about hemostasis, stopping blood loss, we talked about the first response, vascular spasm. We talked about the formation of a platelet plug, which in many ways is the beginning of where we are now with the formation of an actual blood clot. So a blood clot, if you could look at it microscopically, and we're going to see it in the next slide, it looks like a spider web with red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, all kind of stuff stuck in it, and it is so full of material, the blood can't leak out. You may have a little oozing, and you may have seen this from some cuts. That's the plasma of the blood, but the cellular fraction isn't going to escape. Now, you usually find clots that occur in venous injuries because 99% of your superficial blood vessels are veins. That's why you primarily only see the blue vessels in your arms, your legs, your wrist. Why do you think that could or could not be an advantage? Having veins superficial? Uh, well, not necessarily having veins superficial, but not having arteries superficial, but arteries deep. Because how do veins and arteries differ? Okay, well, directionality, yeah. But when you look at the blood inside the artery, it's oxygenated. That's not the principal reason why we want to be safer with the arteries deeper. Have you ever seen those movies, the real cheesy, scary movies where the killer cuts somebody's head off and the blood's squirting? Is that venous blood or is that arterial blood? Why is the arterial blood squirting? That's just made up fakey, but why is arterial blood squirting? Pressure. Higher pressure. Your arterial blood's under higher pressure, so if you damage an artery, you're gonna leak more blood more quickly than in a vein. Also, when we see most clotting happening in a vein, it's also due to the pressure because it's gonna take the clots a little bit to form. They're not going to be instantaneous. And it may take some clots upward of 45 minutes to an hour to really solidify so that it could resist any sort of blood loss. If you're in a high-pressure artery and you have an injury, that blood flow is probably going to remove the beginnings of the clot. The platelet plug, the fibrin web is probably going to get washed away. Now, this is also the point where I like to remind almost all of us, about the thing that we cannot do when we get a cut. So you get a paper cut, right? It's the first thing you do when you get a paper cut. I know for me, the first thing I do is, mm, it goes right in my mouth. I don't know why. It's like, ouch. But then you see that it's bleeding. How do you treat, sorry, we're talking about blood. Okay. Sorry. When, when you have a cut, what do you do from a first aid standpoint? You apply pressure. So you get a paper cut. Oh, man. So you start squeezing. You're looking at your watch. You look. Oh, man, I'm still bleeding. And you apply pressure again. And then you look. And I'm still bleeding. Every time you look after 5, 10 seconds, washes out the clot and you start the clock over. So the take-home message is apply pressure and try to forget about it for several minutes. I'm not saying you've got to hold a paper cut for 45 minutes, but it takes longer than five seconds to help that clot begin to be established enough that it can resist the pressure of the blood flow. Blood clot formation, while we start with a platelet plug, the formation of the clot really depends on the formation and the activation of our clotting protein fibrin. Now, in the bloodstream, fibrin exists as an unactivated protein that's not sticky at all. And it's called fibrinogen. Anytime you see a word that has pre or pro as a prefix or ogen as a suffix, that means it's an inactivated protein. And much like the fire extinguisher that we see on the wall, if there's a fire in this room, and rather than running out screaming and leaving me here to burn, if you're going to put out the fire, 
you're going to grab that fire extinguisher and what are you going to do next after you grab the fire extinguisher? Pull the pin, the pin that's preventing the accidental discharge of the fire extinguisher. If you don't pull the pin, it will never work. If you don't remove a part of the protein, you can never activate fibrinogen into fibrin. So I like to think of the O-gen like the pin on the fire extinguisher. You got to cut it off. You have to pull it off. And there's an enzyme that is going to be activated that converts fibrinogen, the inactive protein, into the active fibrin, which is very, very sticky filamentous protein that's going to form this spider web we call a blood clot. And in this colorful illustration, you can see this meshwork, this netting. It's a scanning electron micrograph that's been colored. The green or turquoise, those are the fibrin filaments that are all stuck and woven together. We've got red blood cells stuck in here. What else do we have stuck in here? Platelets. So we have cells, we have platelets, we have proteins, we have fibrin. It sticks together layer upon layer upon layer. And I think you can see it's going to be a real challenge for cells and even fluid to make its way through this clot. And that's going to lead to our true hemostasis and the real cessation of blood loss. It's going to stop. But even when you looked at that picture and you saw almost that looked like squares with fiber and forming these squares, it's not going to be a stable clot until you cross-link the fibrin and there's a protein in your plasma that's called factor 13, and its job is to cross-link and stabilize fibrin into a solid, stable clot. And that cross-linking of fibrin is the last thing that happens in the formation in our clotting cascade, as we're going to see it. So here's our fibrinogen. It's going to be acted on by an enzyme. I'm going to introduce it here in this illustration. That enzyme is called thrombin. Thrombin's job is to come in and cut the ogen off fibrinogen so that we can form fibrin, and it meshes itself together into this net. It's catching everything. It's sticky. But factor 13 are going to be the diagonal proteins that come in and cross-link and really stabilize that clot so that it can resist the pressure, it can resist the blood pushing against it, and so the bleeding will, in fact, stop. Now, we're going to get into the details of the clotting cascade, but at, at this point, it's almost like we're starting at the end and working our way back. So we've got our factor 13 cross-linked clot, and for the healing process to happen, over time, the fibrin is going to contract. It's going to shrink. And as it does, it's going to pull both sides of our healthy tissue closer and closer together. So there's actually less space to fill in with new material. And as you get those tissue edges closer and closer together, they're actually going to induce each other to begin to undergo mitosis. Again, this kind of takes us back to chapter one, that contact-dependent inhibition of growth. When you open those spaces, cells are going to begin to grow. But if the space is too large, how is your body going to heal? How is your body going to repair that gap? It's going to leave something that doesn't look like the normal surrounding tissue and later in life, somebody's going to say, hey, how did you get that scar. scar? That's connective tissue that fills in. So it's important that we pull those two healthy pieces together so that the space between is small enough that we can fill that in with our normal pattern of our tissue. And once the healing finishes, you really can't even see you had a cut if it was fairly superficial. We've already talked about fibrinogen, the precursor. It's inactive because you really don't want 
fibrinogen beginning a clotting cascade in your circulatory system. Just like we don't want platelets inadvertently activated, we don't want fibrin forming. So that's why it's got the pin like our fire extinguisher. It's not going to go off and start getting sticky until the time is right. And we're going to know the time is right when we start the clotting cascade. And so this illustration shows you the clotting cascade, and I want you to think of it like a series of dominoes. You've seen those videos where people spend days and days stacking up this elaborate array of dominoes just to knock over the first one so that then they, in series, each knock over each other. It's like our second messenger signaling inside the cell. This is going to occur in the blood. All of these factors that we're going to look at on one side are present as inactivated proteins in the plasma. And each one then is going to take a turn activating the next. And so we have two ways to get it started, an intrinsic built in and an extrinsic pathway. We'll define each of these and go through their steps. But the first thing I want to do is look at this portion. Both the intrinsic and extrinsic are going to utilize factor 10. And from factor 10 until we get a cross-linked clot, that is called the common pathway. So instead of having two different illustrations, they combine it here into one. And we're going to start first, as I said, kind of working backwards. We're going to look at the common pathway utilized in both intrinsic and extrinsic clotting cascades. And once, you know, we begin this process and we activate factor 10 through either intrinsic or extrinsic, factor 10 is going to combine with factor 5, another protein. But I want you to, to look very carefully at what else is going to be included. We saw it in axons. We saw it in muscle contraction. And we saw it in signaling with adrenergic receptors. Now we see it again. Here's our old friend. Who is this? Calcium. Factor 10 combines with factor 5, calcium, and phospholipids. Those four components combine together into a complex that is referred to as either the factor 10 complex or the prothrombin activator. Now you see names associated with many of these factors. The numbers are fine. If you memorize the numbers are fine. Some of the names basically tell you what it does. Factor 10 complex, well, you got to remember what it does. But if you remember prothrombin activator, what, what does that thing do? Activates prothrombin, you see? And so factor 10 plus 5, calcium and phospholipids, that turns on the enzymatic activity of this complex, and it works on another inactivated protein in your plasma called prothrombin. The prothrombin activator clips off part of the protein. It removes the pro part, converting it into thrombin. Thrombin is an active enzyme, and guess what thrombin does? Thrombin is the enzyme that activates fibrinogen into fibrin. And so when you put it together in this illustration, and I, I added the calcium and the phosph that's supposed to be an L, PLP, phospholipid. If you, if you have those, the PowerPoint, write that in extra because if you don't have 10 or 5 or calcium or phospholipids in this complex, it will not be activated. It will not convert prothrombin to thrombin. You can't convert fibrinogen to fibrin. You won't get a clot. All right, so that's the common pathway. That's the end of the story. Now we're going to see how to get it started. And there are two ways to start it. The first is the intrinsic pathway. Intrinsic, again, built in. All the proteins are present. This is going to occur when you have a very specific cut or localized damage. I like to think of this as the paper cut plan. 
you get a paper cut. You are going to activate factor 12 because of materials that are released and the contact that happens in the vicinity of that cut. Factor 12 is activated. Factor 12 activates factor 11. Wait, we've already used factor 10. What do we do now? Well, we skip 10 and we go to 9. So 12 gets activated. That's the start. Here's our domino. 12 knocks over 11. 11 knocks over 9. Now, factor 9 is going to combine with factor 8. And who are our other partners that we saw already? Calcium, phospholipids. And this is going to form the factor 8 complex. And the factor 8 complex activates factor 10. And so as we put this into our domino diagram, as I call it. Here's our intrinsic pathway, damaged surface paper cut. Activates 12, 12 activates 11, 11 activates 9, 9 plus 8 plus calcium and phospholipids is the active complex that converts an inactive 10 into active 10 that continues on in the common pathway. You see how it's like that domino? Once you knock over the first one, it's going to go all the way to the end. And this does so fairly rapidly. But the other way that you can activate the clotting cascade, and it goes even faster, is the extrinsic. Extrinsic means from without, from the outside. So we had the paper cut was the intrinsic. This is going to be blunt force trauma, massive damage. I think of this as a shark attack. And in a shark attack, you're going to have so much tissue damage that the cells and the tissues release material that was inside the cell. In particular, it's going to be an activator. And we call this either tissue thromboplastin or factor three is released from the cell. That starts the process. Factor three activates seven, and they combine together. Three and seven combine together, plus calcium, plus phospholipids. Factor seven activates 10, the common pathway. So you see how we have fewer steps? That's how it goes faster. Because I think you can appreciate if you've lost an arm you need to stop that bleeding a whole lot faster than necessarily a paper cut. And so they're both of our activation pathways. You can see the three places where we're going to need calcium and phospholipids. One in the extrinsic, one in the intrinsic, and then this that's used in the common pathway. So calcium, yeah, pretty important. Now, I'm going to get personal here for just a second. And since there's just a few of us, I'm not going to call you out so you don't have to raise your hand. How many of you have had a cut within the last couple of months? Let's say you got a cut three months ago. Do you still have the scab from that cut? What happened to the scab? Okay, does it fall off? Or do we have some scab pickers in here? You know what I'm talking about. Those people that can't stand the scabs and they pick them off. A lot of people that pick off the scabs, they start the bleeding again. And guess what? You're starting the process all over again. But you don't have to because as you produce more and more factor 12, remember that started the intrinsic pathway? As you produce and activate more and more factor 12, in addition to activating 11, Factor 12, over time, is going to activate a molecule called calocrine. That's a real cool name. It sounds like something from Superman's planet. I prefer the name plasminogen activator. Now, plasminogen, OGEN, what does that mean about that protein? 
It's inactive. It's a plasma protein that's inactive. And so once you turn on calicrine because of factor 12, calicrine is going to convert plasminogen into plasmin. Guess what plasmin's job is? To go in and chop up fibrin. Fibrin was the clot. Why would you want to chop it up? To get it out of the way so the tissue can heal. So you have to have a process in which you can remove the clot as well as getting it started in the first place. And plasminogen in the active plasmin is the way you remove the clot. And it's interesting to me that the same protein that starts the process in the intrinsic pathway is the same protein that starts the process of getting rid of the clot. It just takes a little bit longer, but the scab, the clot, does in fact go away over time. Now in clinical settings, there are many instances in which we need the blood to not have those same clotting properties either heart arrhythmias or you might have diabetic patients that have poor circulation which then can lead to low blood pressure, low flow in certain appendages and just that destabilization of the flow. Blood has a smooth laminar flow so there's not a lot of turbulence, a lot of irritation. Anytime you disturb the blood you have the potential of starting the clotting cascade particularly with the platelets. Experimentally when you, we, we talked about the blood donations, you remove the blood, you put it in a plastic bag. You got to somehow prevent the clotting cascade from happening or that's going to be useless. So here's where we talk about the anticoagulants. Would it surprise you if I told you that fibrin in some ways was an anticoagulant? Fibrin being the sticky spider web that forms the clot. Well, fibrin sticks to everything. And if fibrin were somehow set up on a positive feedback mechanism, your clot would be the clot that ate the planet because it would never stop growing. So in a sense, fibrin's ability to stick to anything and everything, including thrombin, the enzyme that activates fibrin, the more fibrin you have, the more thrombin you stick to fibrin, that means thrombin is turned off and it can't activate any more fibrin. You see the negative sort of feedback there? So over time, the more fibrin you have, the slower the formation of the clot's going to be until it stops. Now, I, I use that idea of it being an anticoagulant kind of loosely. But in fact, it's a way to negatively feed back and slow down and stop the building up of a clot when you've had enough that forms to cause hemostasis. But in your body, we actually have cells that produce and secrete natural anticoagulants, namely mast cells. Mast cells are going to be blood cells that actually leave the circulation. We'll define them at the end of this chapter. And as your immune system cells leave blood vessels and encounter the extracellular environment, invariably there's going to be blood leaking out. Platelets may in fact contact von Willebrand's factor. Clotting factors may be activated. However, as these cells need to exit more and more, especially in an inflammatory response, these mast cells produce heparin. Heparin's a carbohydrate called a glycosaminoglycan, which is a repeating disaccharide chain of sugars. And what heparin does is it binds to an inactivator of thrombin. It's called antithrombin-3. So antithrombin-3 prevents the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin so you could never get a clot. And so that increases a blood vessel's leakiness, if you will, making it easier for white blood cells to get out into the tissue where an infection usually resides, and you don't get a clot. Even though we know that heparin's not really good clinically, 
Because heparin may stay in your system for 24 hours before you can clear it. So you would not want to use heparin as an anticoagulant for a blood donation and then give that blood to a patient that just had an operation because the next 24 hours, they're needing to clot, they're needing to heal the incisions, and they're still bleeding. No, that's a bad idea. So this illustration essentially shows antithrombin-3. The little blue bar underneath, that is going to be heparin. When heparin binds to antithrombin-3, which is inactivated in your plasma, it turns it on. And when antithrombin-3 turns on, it binds to, ooh, what factor is that? Factor 10, preventing the activation of factor 10. Now you see you can never activate prothrombin into thrombin. You'll never convert fibrinogen into fibrin. You don't get a clot. Heparin's used a lot in basic science in the laboratory, but very little is heparin going to be used in a clinical setting because there are easier and better ways to do that. The clinical way to do that is lower your calcium levels. How do you lower calcium levels? Well, you can use chelating agents. Chelators are materials that bind to metal ions such as calcium, magnesium, and citric acid is going to be the principal chelating agent used most often in clinical settings. When you give blood or you give plasma, typically they're going to have some uh, citric acid placed into that material first. And so as your blood, which contains calcium, combines with the citric acid, it's going to form calcium citrate. The calcium binds into the, with the citrate, and it's not available to bind with those three clotting complexes the 8 complex, the 10 complex. So you're never going to act, activate prothrombin to thrombin. You're never going to convert fibrinogen to fibrin. You cannot clot the blood. It simply won't clot. But what's cool about using citric acid is when you then transfuse that blood into the patient, this blood-containing calcium citrate, guess what? The liver breaks it down into citrate and calcium. So now you've given the patient not only blood that they need, the red blood cells, the platelets they need, but you've given calcium they need to do what? Clot, if they have an injury. So it's like you're giving them all the good stuff. Another key later, EDTA. You see this as a preservative in, in a lot of foods. You'll use this in your laboratory settings a lot. Ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. This is another chemical that can be broken down by the liver, broken down into acetic acid. Acetic acid is plugged into the Krebs cycle, help you make energy. And in this illustration, you see two vials. One has EDTA added to it. The other has no anticoagulant added. Which of these tubes has the chelator added to it, the one on the right or the one on the left? The one on the right. When you coagulate the blood, the blood is going to separate out from the plasma because it becomes a sticky, chunky, massive mess of cells that just precipitates to the bottom, leaving our straw-colored plasma on the top. It looks like we've run this through a centrifuge to determine our hematocrit, but this, in fact, is just the coagulation of the blood that occurs because of the clotting cascade. I mentioned earlier that blood normally has a laminar undisturbed flow. Well, in patients that have cardiac arrhythmias, my, my dad, for instance, he has atrial fibrillation. That creates turbulence in the blood, and that turbulence could potentially be enough to start the clotting cascade. And so my dad is on pharmacologic that lowers the blood's ability to clot. It doesn't eliminate it, but it lowers it so that there's less likely a chance of a clot forming inadvertently. And basically, the drug is Coumadin. This comes from first identified leeches, which is Coumarin. But really, the name that scientists know this is Warfarin. 
Now, this is really cool how this works. Coumadin does not bind to calcium. But in fact, Coumadin works on the molecular biology of the cell. Because in your cells, you have an amino acid, glutamate. But your cells, especially the ones that are producing our clotting proteins, they're produced in the liver primarily. These liver cells will produce a glutamate that is actually modified, and it is a gamma carboxy glutamate. That gamma carboxy glutamate is a high calcium binding amino acid. You're going to find that on those factor 10s, factor 8s, factor 7s. That, that's how we can form those complexes with calcium and phospholipids. So what Coumadin does is it basically causes you to have a vitamin K deficiency at the molecular level, vitamin K then being essential for forming carboxy, this gamma carboxy glutamate. So now you're producing factor 8s, factor 10s, factor 7s that can't bind calcium. Is that factor ever going to be able to activate the clotting cascade downstream? No. So you reduce, and depending on how much of this Coumadin you give, you can reduce or you could eliminate the ability of the blood clot. Now, giving too much and reducing the ability of the blood to clot, that's going to be a bad thing clinically, right? Because your gums bleed, your gastrointestinal tract bleeds. You give too high a dosage, you can bleed out. Bad for patients, but good for those homeowners that have rat problems. Because this is the same stuff you put in rat poison, warfarin. Rats come along, gobble it up because they make it taste good. Rats eat so much of it, they bleed out internally and die. Makes me kind of nervous to know my dad is essentially taking everyday rat poison. Now, he's not. He's not. But you see the kind of relationship there. Now, if you have pets... When you put out this rat poison, you have to be very careful where you place it. Because if you have a little, like we do Pomeranian, and they get into the rat poison, they're goners. Now, if you have a big, you know, sheepdog, Rottweiler, whatever, they could eat some of this and get sick, but probably not die, unless they ate a whole box of it or something, because they're so massive. But it's not going to discriminate rodents versus pets, or kids for that matter. So you've got to be careful when you have this poisonous material laying around the house. Now we finally get to that last component, the white blood cells. White blood cells are much less abundant than the red blood cells. Remember, there was a thousand red blood cells for every white blood cell. But there are quite a few of these in a normal healthy individual and there will be more when you have an infection or, or you get sick. But unlike red blood cells that stay in the circulatory system, if you've got red blood cells out in your connective tissue, you've got a problem because the clotting cascade didn't happen. But white blood cells can move back and forth. They can migrate. And that movement in and out of your blood vessel is called diapedesis because it's going to be important to get out there and attack the infection where it's starting rather than letting it get established. What was our lifespan for red blood cells? Do you remember? 120 days. I love the fact that the average lifespan of leukocytes also has a 1 and a 2. 120 versus 12. Well, it's 120 days. Not 12 days, but how long? 12 hours. 12 hours. Now, we're going to have some white blood cells that can stay around your whole life, but most are going to be very short-lived. And unlike red blood cells that underwent erythropoiesis in myeloid tissues, white blood cells are going to undergo leukopoiesis in lymphoid tissues. The precursors are still going to be the bone marrow, but these cells are going to become immunocompetent and finish their development in places like the lymph nodes, tonsils, spleen, thymus, in portions of the submucosa of your gastrointestinal tract, your airway, 
This is where they're going to finish their development. It's set up shop to protect you against infections. Now we're going to subdivide our leukocytes further into two major groups. And this is going to be divided on whether they have these specific vesicles called granules or not. All white blood cells are going to have vesicles called lysosomes. They can break down materials. But only one group has these specific vesicles to place them into a group we call granulocytes. The other group, very creatively, we call A granulocytes. Because when you see a word with an A or an AN in front of it, what does that prefix mean? It's not. not or without. So granulocytes and without granules, A granulocytes. Both are going to come from a common precursor stem cell. They're going to divide themselves. They're going to become more and more specific so that we have a lymphoblast cell line, a monoblast cell line, and myoblast recursors. It's not going to be critical we understand this development. You, again, get that in histology class if you take that down the road. But for us, we're going to continue to look, as you can see in this illustration, we're going to have three white blood cells we call granulocytes. We're going to define them based on the color of stain they take up histologically. Then we're going to have our macrophages, which we've already talked about, named many of those, and then our lymphocytes. The macrophages and our lymphocytes don't have the specific granules, so they are, in fact, that group of A granulocytes. So when we look at our formed elements, again like in a hematocrit, when you centrifuge that volume of blood, at the bottom we've got erythrocytes, 45% of the volume of blood. But then in between the red blood cells and the plasma, there's a little white layer, it's called the buffy coat. And in that buffy coat, we're going to have the leukocytes and the platelets. Platelets are more numerous than the leukocytes, but platelets are teeny tiny, and the leukocytes are bigger. So now let's characterize each one of these five white blood cells and we're going to start with our granulocytes category. With the most abundant being neutrophils. They got their name because when you hit them with a stain they really don't carry much of a stain and they look very similar to the same color of erythrocytes. So they're said to be neutral in color. Neutrophil. About 70% of your white blood cells are neutrophils. They're everywhere. And because they're everywhere, these white blood cells are the first ones to get to the scene of the infection. And that's going to be out in your tissues. They undergo diapedesis. And because they're so abundant, this is the reason for our average lifespan of our white blood cell. It's based on the neutrophils. They only hang around for 12 hours. And so they're referred to as the short hitters. I like to call the neutrophils the Marines. We just had Memorial Day, and when you think of those guys landing on the beaches of Normandy, many of them didn't last long. They hit the beach and phew, machine gun got them. These neutrophils are going to be the first ones at the site of the infection. They're, they're going to be hand-to-hand -hand combat with the infection, and many of these are going to die. So those are the first ones in. Neutrophils are also referred to as polymorphonuclear leukocytes, PMNs. Because their nucleus with age is going to add lobes. You may start out with three lobes, but then as that neutrophil gets older, you may end up having five to six lobes before that cell dies. And so that's one of the principal characteristics of a neutrophil. Here in this illustration, we see a neutrophil in the center. You see how it looks kind of sandy, grainy, and that those granules are kind of the same color as our red blood cell. That's the neutral issue. But then you look in the cell, and it almost looks 
like it's got multiple nuclei, but then again, you can see some of these strands of uh, nuclear material connecting them all together. So these are just lobes of this particular nucleus. In this one, there may be three, possibly four lobes to the nucleus of this neutrophil. Again, we're looking at a peripheral blood smear. We see a little, one little lone platelet over here on the right side. So those are our, our short hitters. First ones in, first ones to die. Because when they get there, much like macrophages, they are going to gobble up the material by phagocytosis. They're going to literally eat like an amoeba eats food. They're going to gobble up the infection. And so in this illustration, you can see a bacterium is being brought into a neutrophil. And once we form a vesicle around that bacterium that's called a phagosome, our lysosomal vesicles are going to fuse with the phagosome membrane and inject those hydrolytic enzymes into the same compartment. Now we have a phagolysosome, and that's going to break down that material. Some of the material can be recycled. The cell could use it. The rest of the material is just going to be spit back out of the cell after it's, it's done. But these neutrophils, by and large, are going to gobble so much material, kill the bacteria, that it's also going to kill the neutrophil itself. So many of these neutrophils are going to go within those 12 hours. Isn't that what pus is? Yeah. We're getting there. It's a component of it. Now, our second less abundant, much less abundant granulocyte are the eosinophils. Only maybe 2 to 3% of all of our white blood cells. Eosinophils are going to have much larger granules, and they're going to stain a fairly dark reddish color. Eosinophils, in addition to those dark red granules, are going to be bilobed. They're only two lobes to the nucleus. So that's how they're fairly easily identified. And eosinophils are going to somewhat specialize in gobbling up parasites, but also assisting in the removal of antibody antigen complexes, especially during allergic reactions. So when you look at your blood counts and you see a higher number of neutrophils or a higher number of eosinophils, it may give you an indication of what's going on inside of the body. So back to our peripheral smear, here we have another large granular white blood cell. Do you see how much larger these granules are? You, you can hardly see the cytoplasm. But then you can see the two lobes of the nucleus. Not three, not six, but only two deep red granules lead you to know that that is an eosinophil. Now, the last granulocyte, these are the ones that we like the least. And it's a good thing that they are among the lowest percent-wise of white blood cells in our circulation. And these are the basophils. They're also bilobed, but they have large, deep blue granules. And there's, they're going to be so big and so numerous, you're really not going to even see the nucleus, even though we say it's bilobed also. These granules that fill the cytoplasma basophils, among other things, contain heparin. Whoa, didn't we just talk about heparin? What is heparin? Anticoagulant. We see these cells secreting it during an inflammatory response. These granules also have histamine, which is a vasodilator. So, Basophils cause your blood vessels to be leaky and cause your blood vessels to open up so more blood can get there and more blood can leak. Well, we don't really want the blood to leak, and that's not really what's going on. They want to make it easier for more white blood cells to get there, get out, and get to the infection. But we don't like them because especially when the blood vessels in our nasal mucosa get leaky and swollen, and we start sniffing and sneezing, we go to our medicine chest and start taking what? Antihistamines that are coming from the basophils. So we are trying to prevent the basophils from helping us. 
But unfortunately, basophils aren't always on the same team we are, especially in allergic responses. Basophils are one of two of our white blood cell types that the name changes depending on their location. We refer to these cells as basophils when they're in the circulation. But when they undergo diapodesis and move into your tissues, we then call them mast cells. Some people refer to them as tissue basophils. I still like mast cells. And when you take a look at these, all you see are these big blue dots. I mean, you, you can't even see the nucleus in this illustration. That's your basophil. Mast cell or tissue basophil? Oh, diapodesis. Now, we're going to get into this much more when we get to our immune system and allergies. That's going to be for exam three. But it's the mast cells that can inadvertently have some antibodies stuck to their surface. And when you are in contact with that allergen again, you can get this massive release of histamine and heparin, even to the point that it might be life-threatening. So it's, it's the mast cells that are really playing this unpleasant role with our allergies. Now, last two leukocytes are the A granulocytes. And the first one we look at are going to be the most numerous of, of well, not most numerous, but very important. And these are the monocytes. Monocytes in the circulation, but once these undergo diapodesis and move into the tissues, that's when we call them macrophages. These, these are, are going to be fairly large. They have sort of an indented kidney shape to them. Like our other white blood cells, chemotactic, they can be drawn to the side of the location by other white blood cells secreting chemical signals. And the monocytes are going to be the reinforcements. The neutrophils were the Marines, first one on the beach. The macrophages are the reinforcements. They're going to come in late, may take two to three days to get there, but they're going to clean up the mess and take care of what's left over. And much like the neutrophils gobbling up all this material, they are going to take themselves out as well as the debris of the neutrophils, the debris of the pathogens. And like Adrian said, dead and dying neutrophils and macrophages are known by the unpleasant word pus. I've, I've looked for a more scientific pleasant word, but that's it. It's just pus. So there's our, what would we call this cell? Monocyte or macrophage? Because it's in the peripheral blood, you see red blood cells, so that's our monocyte. Large nucleus, you can see that indention lets you know that you're looking at a monocyte. And even though this looks granular, we do have lysosomes, but we don't have those larger specific granules that we saw with our granulocytes. This is a cool SEM picture. It shows a macrophage gobbling two red blood cells. Now, they don't normally do that. I'm sure that this might be different species of blood cells, but you can see this macrophage extending its plasma membrane around this top right red blood cell and beginning to do the same thing with this lower right red blood cell. That's the phagocytosis engulfing this material. Now the last white blood cell, last A granulocyte are the lymphocytes. And these are the second most abundant only to neutrophils. These are going to be very small. When you look at these, you almost only see a nucleus, very little rim of cytoplasm. And these lymphocytes are going to be those cells that function in our immune system, either the production of antibodies, which we call humoral immunity, or the cell-mediated immunity, which are going to be our T lymphocytes. You can't distinguish these when you look at a peripheral blood smear, 
Here you see a cell that's barely bigger than a red blood cell, but you see how it's mostly just nucleus. So that is a peripheral blood look at a lymphocyte. And when we get to our immune system chapter, we will distinguish between the B lymphocyte that produces antibodies and the T lymphocyte that actually directly attacks our pathogens. So this is just a synopsis of our formed elements, erythrocytes, platelets, our three granulocytes, and our lymphoid lineage. They've left off, I don't know why they were so snobby and left off macrophages, but we also include those as well.